Hello everybody, welcome back to this Claire Chatterbox. I'm Mike Sork. This is the show <laughs> where we, uh, you know, uh, bring up the topics and, and talk about, they just have a nice roundtable discussion for the most part. Um, and uh, today, uh, the, the topic is going to be a really, again, hot button issue these days, universal health care. Um, I don't know much about it, so this will be a learning experience for myself. With us, as usual, is Tears of Mason. And uh, with us today is Bob Mason. He's the VP of Healthcare for all PA for the Healthcare PA. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about, about the group? Well, Healthcare for All PA is a statewide, grassroots, all-volunteer organization. We have chapters throughout Pennsylvania, and what we're doing is we're promoting a just, civilized, humane type of health care reform. Okay. You're using those words, just, civilized, humane, and when we use adjectives like that, we're sort of implying that the health care system we have now is not a just, civilized, or humane health care system. Can you comment a little bit on that? Well, there are a number of problems uh, with our current health care system, and most people are aware of it, if not all aspects of what's problematic. They've run into problems with it. Uh, if they're fortunate enough to have health care, they're finding that uh, they're paying more and more for premiums, co-pays, and deductibles, and we're finding that many people, the ones who are considered considered underinsured, about 37 million throughout the United States, uh, tend to put off getting important preventive care or routine care because of those deductibles and co-pays, and eventually their health suffers, and when they finally have it attended to, it's more expensive, and uh, they miss more work, etc. Right. So that those have been issues that have been talked about now for quite some time in the media and, and people are aware of them. And and so in the last couple of years we've we've had the, the national health care plan that came out in Obama's administration. That's supposed to fix all of that. So why is there an effort in Pennsylvania to, to do something with single payer when we've got this wonderful national plan that's gonna fix all these problems? Well the um Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which was signed by President Obama in March of 09, was definitely, uh, or actually March of 2010, was definitely a high watermark in terms of health care reform that uh, progressives and liberals and moderates have been promoting for over a hundred years. So it was really a political victory to get that extensive type of reform passed. But unfortunately, because of all the compromises, it doesn't really do enough to control costs, and it leaves too many people out in the cold. Uh, when all is said and done, there will still be probably about 20, 23 million people uninsured. And because some of the benefit packages um, are so stripped down, or the uh, premiums are so high in order to um, pay for those benefit packages, uh, there will still be underinsured folks. Mm -hmm. and, and still people are having to get their insurance largely from their employers, correct? Primarily, but what's happened over the last 10 years is that fewer and fewer employers are providing insurance. Mm -hmm. Uh, so right now, I think it's about 60% of uh, people receive their insurance through employers, uh, that is, f folks under 65. Okay, so the, the Healthcare for All PA has been around longer than 2009 and has been working on, on uh, the effort to, to uh, get a single-payer system passed in Pennsylvania. Um, and then along comes this, this effort on the national level. How, how, is, how has that changed the, the picture of what you're trying to accomplish? Well, let me explain a little bit about single payer, because that will provide some context. What that term means is that health care would be publicly financed uh, through revenues, through wellness uh, fees that all of us will pay, wellness taxes that businesses and individuals will pay. Oh, there's that word, taxes. Um, yes, <laughs> um, and we're not shy about that. I'll explain mm -hmm. that a little bit later. 
but um, basically it's uh, publicly financed but privately delivered health care. Uh, so so what does that mean? Well, what that means is that um, people pay into the system through taxes. Uh, they will not have premium payments to make. They will not have deductibles to make. They won't have copays to make. Everything will be covered. Uh, and there will be a central administration which will reimburse health care providers for the services they deliver and everyone will have an opportunity to choose the health care provider that he or she wishes uh, instead of being restricted to those who are covered by a particular insurance panel. Uh, so what it really means is that there will be more of an opportunity for competition among health care providers for patients uh, there'll be more choice for patients and there'll be less anxiety about being able to afford health care and uh, it changing from year to year in terms of a different insurance plan or a different insurance company providing that coverage. Right, because most of us have had experience where we've, we've had uh, Health America say and we had an HMO, we had a doctor we liked, they got to know the doctor, and then the company bought a new insurance plan, and then we had to change doctors because the new insurance plan didn't, didn't have the same panel of doctors, and we had to switch doctors again. Um, and that's really annoying. And I, I certainly know some of my clients and, and people that I know, friends who have had to do that three and four and five times uh, in, a, in a decade, which is very disruptive to any kind of good medical care. Um, so you're saying that that's not going to be necessary. If, if we have single payer, people can settle in with a doctor and they don't have to worry about that kind of thing. Yeah, that's right. And research shows that when people find a good doctor or enable, and are able to maintain that relationship over years, that doctor gets to know them better. They have more confidence in the doctor and they end up receiving better health care. Okay. It's called having a medical home. Having a medical home. That sounds good. I like that idea. Okay, so, so why don't we have this? I mean, how long has this effort been going on in Pennsylvania? Well, the effort started about 10 years ago, and uh, the reason that uh, we've not been able to accomplish single-payer um, health care here in Pennsylvania, or really in any other state around the country, is that there are financial interests that support the current system uh, through uh, lobbying and uh, campaign finances and that sort You're of thing. You're talking about big insurance and big pharma, mm -hmm. primarily. Yes. Okay, so because we have a system, uh, we have a system in this country that healthcare is really a commodity that's marketed in the marketplace. It's bought and sold. People can can buy it. Uh, and that's, in fact, you can go now to the Highmark store and buy your insurance policy. Um, just like you would go and, and, and you know and buy a car. You can get the, the features that you want. And so this this plan is saying we're gonna we're gonna step out of that system. We're not gonna have insurance that uh, we're not gonna have health care that's funded by insurance companies, but we're gonna do it through a system of taxes. Mm -hmm. That that's is that a difficult thing because you know Let's say we're saying we're talking about a full replacement of the current insurance that's system here, about, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. I mean the, the, the resistance it's gotta be great because I mean that that would eliminate these companies, right. can't they? It wouldn't necessarily totally eliminate them. They mm -hmm. could still offer insurance plans that would supplement the benefit package under uh, the single payer plan that we're proposing well, for here in Pennsylvania. What would you need supplement for if you're covering everything? Well, if someone, for example, wanted um, cosmetic surgery, mm -hmm. if someone that wasn't to repair an injury from an accident, let's say, or from necessary medical surgery, but purely uh, because they wanted a different look, mm -hmm. the plan would not cover that. Perhaps so they it's could not buy, medically necessary, right. would, they would cover that. Okay. Maybe exactly. even more healthy things, like a, 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 I say preventative medicine, like, like to go to your yoga or something like that, maybe, would be outside that scope. Well, basically the plan will cover um, all medically necessary services mm -hmm. and if uh, there are alternative or complementary medicine 
services that have been researched and, and approved by the National Institutes of Health, the benefit plan could cover those. Or it would be like chiropractic or maybe shiatsu or acupuncture or something like that. Reiki, uh, okay. yeah, yeah, depending on the uh, evidence to support. Prima modalities that have some research that back mm -hmm. them up as being efficacious. Okay. Uh, correct, correct. Okay. So that would might be an expansion upon what people have now. Now I should explain how we're able to do this. Now, let me explain a little bit about the tax. So there would be a tax of 3% on personal, um, there would be a 3% tax on what's called um, individual uh, personal income. Um, and then there would be a 10% of gross payroll tax for businesses. Now, 95% of people would be paying a lot less for health care than they do now and receiving a lot more. And many businesses that do provide health care find that uh, they're paying t about 20% of payroll for health care. So, so people paying are paying less because they're no longer paying premiums, co-payments, co-insurance, and all those kinds of things, which amounts to a lot of money. When you, especially if you've got a chronic condition or you know, you're on uh, maintenance medication or something like mm -hmm. that. Okay. Yeah, correct. Um, so they'll pay less because of that, uh, because 3% of their personal income for most people will be less than maybe the premiums they're paying and there'll be no deductibles, no copays. And what will be covered are prescriptions and visits to a doctor, uh, dental, vision, of course, hospital care, durable medical equipment, and even long-term care. Mm -hmm. The way we're able to do that is that we sharply reduce administrative overhead. So right now, um, if you have a nonprofit plan uh, like uh, UPMC or Highmark, uh, by the time that you add in their administrative costs and the costs of the provider in interfacing with that plan, somewhere between uh, 20 and 25 cents out of every dollar is in overhead. If it's an insurance company that's a for-profit one and has an obligation to uh, provide profits to their shareholders, that climbs to 30 to 35 cents out of every dollar. Under our plan, administrative overhead is limited to five percent. That sounds about like what we're hearing is the administrative overhead of Medicare, for example. Correct. Is yes. that the kind of model mm -hmm. we're talking about here? Well, um, we call would call it new and improved Medicare. Uh, Medicare is a great plan, uh, but it also has some uh, kinks in it that need to be smoothed out, and we believe our plan would be an improvement. And what we really are doing is, in a sense, we would be building on the reform that was passed under the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. You're talking about HIPAA? Um, no, not no. HIPAA, but this is what's called Obamacare. Oh, okay. We would be improving on that. One of the um, aspects of that uh, act allows for states to uh, experiment or innovate with different types of approaches to health care. Um, right now that doesn't occur until 2017, but there are a lot of efforts, including with the um, uh, in the Obama administration to move that to 2014. And that would permit states like ours to innovate uh, with single payer. Right now the states that are really in the forefront in uh, trying to do that are Vermont and Hawaii. Okay. Now, Massachusetts passed a, a, a similar system in, several years ago, and from what I understand, they haven't been doing very well with that system. Can you comment on why that might not be working as well as they intended? Well, it's actually the model in many respects for this Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act that was passed and, and signed in 2010. Um, one of the reasons that one of the problems they're having is it doesn't control costs enough, so health care costs are climbing. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, they're covering about 95% of, uh, of 
their residents, and that's really admirable. Right, and that's a requirement. If you live in Massachusetts, you have to, to buy insurance, whether you can afford it or not, which I don't know how you enforce that sort of thing. Well, there is that, are is that some... Part of, is that part of this package, too, that you'd have to sign on to this? There are some subsidies uh, for folks in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. just as there are under the federal plan, mm -hmm. and, but there are some people who are priced out of... Uh, of being able to afford and the health care. And that would not happen with the single parent pension? This wouldn't happen because basically anyone who is a resident of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. would be covered. And so we're really talking about legal immigrants, aliens, the homeless, migratory workers, uh, anyone who legally would be required to file a Pennsylvania income tax return. Now, that doesn't mean that they actually owe a tax, mm -hmm. but is required to file a return is covered by this plan. So uh, they pay 3% of whatever income they have, personal income, mm -hmm. and they are covered. And what if someone isn't working or doesn't have personal income? What, what kind of coverage do they get? Then uh, they still are covered uh, because uh, it's based on their income. If they have no income, it's 3% of nothing, which is nothing. So they're still covered. Okay. So basically at this point, your uh, driver's license becomes your insurance card. Essentially, there would be one card, and it really wouldn't be the driver's license mm -hmm. because you wouldn't have to have a driver's mm -hmm. license, but there would be one card. Mm -hmm. That's all you would have to uh, show to a provider of health care, and they would know how to file the claim, and there would be one claim form and one place to send that claim. Mm -hmm. So it's administratively very simple for the provider. Yeah, and for providers, being a provider of, of mental health care, um, I'm involved in probably 10 or 12 different insurance panels, and, and I know you are too as a, as a clinical social worker, that um, it's a nightmare to, to figure out what people's insurance actually is offering them. Uh, even um, clients come in, they have no idea what their insurance offers them. We have one in our uh, one agency that I work with, uh, uh, two and a half people chasing money, uh, and uh, because it's different, everybody's got a different insurance plan, and uh, insurance plans are, are very inefficient in getting uh, in getting reimbursements to you in a timely fashion. Um, so that would make it much more simple. It sounds like just yeah. send in one form and. You're done. Several years ago, there was research that indicated that the average doctor spends two and a half weeks a year dealing with insurance companies. Wow. You know, if you add in all the time that they spend, so that's even with a significant support staff to chase the money, but to seek authorization and that sort of thing, they spend about two and a half weeks a year they would not have to do that under our plan. Okay, this sounds really good. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't we have it? What, what's holding up the progress? Well, again, it's it really is politics and uh, scare tactics and that sort of thing. People don't really understand necessarily how it can benefit them and benefit uh, business and benefit um, uh, municipalities, school districts, etc. So how does it benefit those? those well, things? a couple of things. Uh, we did some research, our organization did some research a couple of years ago, and we determined that um, across the state, if every school district, municipality, uh, county, et cetera, every level of government across the state, not including state government, but all those other levels, uh, if we had our single-payer plan, they would have saved $2.3 billion on health care. Wow. So that would enable have enabled them to either lower taxes or to provide more services, including um, beefing up education in the particular school districts. So that's just one example. Um, Second thing is that in, in Pennsylvania, there are about 1.5, 1.8 million uninsured. It's about 11% of our population. Um, if those people were covered with um, health care, then we would need a lot more health care providers. Mm -hmm. So we also would increase uh, employment that way. Now, 
they would also have to that would also have to absorb the people who would be displaced from the current uh, well, and it's not like we have tons of healthcare system. people sitting on shelves waiting for employment that, mm-hmm. that doesn't exist yet. People have to be trained mm-hmm. for those positions, and that and not everybody is is suitable to be trained. I mean, they don't have the interest or the, the capability of being trained for a career in the in the health field. It takes what an average of ten to twelve years to train a doctor. So. That's an issue. But then what do you do with all these insurance agents and managed care people and everybody mm-hmm. else in the, who, who uh, make up the insurance industry? What are we going to do with those folks? Well, we'll certainly need people to administer this program. So there will be a certain amount of employment within the structure that administra- administers the program. But the other thing is part of the bill is two years of transitional assistance for them in job training. Mm-hmm. So and how does that get funded? Again, that's that all same, through this health amount. and wellness uh, uh, revenue. There'd be enough money in that system then to, mm-hmm. to provide that. Yes. Mm, that's amazing. So uh, you mentioned about the scare tag and everything. I know every time I hear help, you know, and I have friends on both sides of the aisle, whoever they support. Uh, but you know, the scare taxes I hear are are the debt panels, and and and, and that's what I kind of uh, first thing pops in my mind when you talk about what uh, is determined, you know, to be covered. Uh, can you speak a little bit of that and, and, and displace that notion uh, in, any, in any capacity for this plan, at least? Yeah, first of all, there were, weren't any uh, death panels at mm-hmm. all. Mm-hmm. It was really under the federal plan, the opportunity for doctors to be compensated to be able to talk to folks about end-of-life planning, which many uh, seniors appreciate and their families appreciate, uh, but it would be up to that senior um, how they wanted to uh, finish up their life. So no one was going to be um, pulling the plug, so to speak, against their wishes. So that was really uh, or no scare one was tactic. going to be extending someone's life with with medical uh, heroics if they didn't wish it. So th- that's the other side of that concern. Correct, and and people have been able to um, sign living wills, etc., to prevent that anyway for mm-hmm. a number of years. This was simply to make sure that uh, they could get some sensitive counseling around the different options. But under our plan, um, we don't actually have a provision for that under our plan. Anything that is deemed to be medically necessary is covered. End of story. So there's not any managed care oversight to it. If a licensed healthcare professional deems something to be okay. medically necessary and submits the appropriate claim, it is covered. Okay. Okay. So yeah. any any medical practitioner who wants to participate and they're duly licensed in their in their field is able to provide care. Okay, yes. okay, because that that the way it was explained, I, I, I misinterpreted it as, like, is there a group of people that determines what's a, a, a you know, deemed appropriate? But, but you say, you know, my doctor says that this is, this is appropriate for my well-being, then, then it's covered. Yeah, there will be a, um, there will be a board which each year examines the benefit package Mm -hmm. and evaluates uh, cutting-edge medical care and whether or not it should be included, etc. So there could be some various shifts from year to year, but in terms of what people are used to, this would be greatly expanded coverage. And really, is that any different than what insurance companies are doing anyways, I mean, determining one way or another? Uh, And actually, it is uh, less heavy-handed than what insurance companies are doing now. Mm -hmm. Because it really will often be between the patient and their health care provider. I I can have an insurance provider that says, um, like for instance, I go, I have a thyroid issue, and I go in in my insurance provider, this one covered the blood test, this one doesn't, which really seems arbitrary on my end as a a, a customer, as a client, as a Mm -hmm. patient. Um, but this would be more across the board. That's something that would, you know, lead to this, you know, and presumably be covered. Yeah, that would be covered. Preventive care would be covered. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing that is part of the package is support for first responders. We have a tremendous voluntary first responder system here in, in uh, Pennsylvania uh, through fire departments and lots of municipalities. 
and uh, rescue squads and that sort of thing. And uh, these are tremendously civic-minded volunteers who, uh, who staff these uh, services and we believe there should be more support. And what we're finding, what's been occurring over the last uh, decade or so is uh, those services have been hurting for volunteers. We believe they should be supported. So part of the package is a thousand dollar tax credit for any first volunteer first responder in Pennsylvania. Ad additionally, uh, we believe in preventive care, so part of the benefit package is preventive care, but also people need uh, uh, to be informed about uh, their health. So there's a K through 12 uh, health education component. And that reflects that some of the folks involved in our movement are uh, public health physicians. So they're concerned about the overall uh, health system. See, there's, and there's been a drop off in schools as far as health. I, mean, I remember having health class when I was in school, um, and I'm 30 now to give you an idea when that was. But I mean, it, I've heard about gym classes have been cut. Is the health program been cut in a lot of the cases too because of this? It, you know, I really can't speak to that. It wouldn't surprise me, mm -hmm. but uh, um, this certainly would be a way of augmenting or. Um, reintroducing uh, health so maybe programs. maybe a more comprehensive than what we have now I mean I'm yes. not, you know uh, I remember the pyramids <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. maybe more expand upon that and update that because I'm sure they're working on it uh, pyramid food pyramid from 10 years ago I know it's changed yeah, it's know? completely upside down now exactly oh it's like yeah it's like a, is it a different uh, shape now is it like an octane I, I think the, the emphasis on uh, on the accessibility for uh, wellness care is really important because mm -hmm. I, I think even in my own case that you know I have an insurance plan that I pay for that costs me a lot of money and I have a very high deductible. So um, I can go into my, my doctor's office for a, a complaint and pay a copay, but um, I can't just go in there for a well visit, okay, to, to just kind of get some ideas about how to increase my wellness. And, and I don't make use of my health care plan because I, it costs me too much money. You also have to trick those questions into the yearly checkup. <laughs> Right. It's like, hey, should I be running more, Doc? Yeah, uh, yeah. You know. So, you know, obviously I need to take responsibility for my own health. We all need mm -hmm. to do that. But um, what we're seeing is people coming into their doctor's offices or emergency rooms or hospitals a lot sicker before they actually access the healthcare system than they would be if they could access it when they're just beginning some of these problematic areas or or disease processes when they could get you know nipped in the bud early but they're not doing it because they can't afford the copays and the contracts. Exactly. I, I, personally it's discouraged me because I've watched my because it used to be everything was covered I, I worked at a place for six years and then I started had to you know then money started to come out of my paycheck because mm -hmm. they couldn't cover it. Then I pay my copay, but then I got a bill for another couple hundred dollars from a doctor's visit and tests. It's, and, and it's like, you know, hey, I'd love to come for my six month checkup for my condition, but I really can't afford it right now. You know, mm -hmm. and that, that really does become a real issue out there, you know, especially if, you know, depending on the level you're, you're employed too. It does become an issue, but four years ago I had a major health crisis and had major surgery. Mm -hmm. I had 16 different vendors involved in my care that I had to be responsible for. Now here I am at home trying to recover from major surgery and I'm on the phone at least an hour and a half a day if not longer trying to deal with these vendors figuring out how much I can pay on this bill or that bill or another bill making sure that no one's going to report me to my credit you know uh, bureau because I missed a payment which you know with 16 different vendors and trying to recover from you know, from what I was recovering from was pretty difficult. Um, but my doctor requires or wants me to have a an MRI every year. Well, because of my copay, I have to pay $1,250 for that test, and I can't afford that. That adds another $100 a month minimum on to what I have to pay for my premium. So I haven't gotten that test in the last couple of years. So I'm playing Russian roulette with my health hoping that I'm not going to have to have that test again until I have a symptom. But of course, if I have a symptom, mm -hmm. then, then I've got a problem. Uh, it's kind of a go along with the horror stories that lead into need for something like this. Uh, I have a friend, I think him or his sister had a broken arm, you know, ages ago when they were younger. Mm -hmm. And I met this guy you know, in high school. Um, and I know 
his yeah, I think his his father had a, a multiple sclerosis or something, uh, but the, they couldn't afford to you know pay for fixing the broken arm, but they would pay like five bucks or whatever, and probably took about twenty years to pay it off, mm-hmm. you know. But you know, and this is the kind of stuff people are dealing with. Well, you're not always getting the option to pay that. I've had a couple of times when I've had an outstanding medical bill, and I've been told that I have to pay a certain amount each month, or it would be reported to credit, and it's more than I can afford. So, you know, people are making, and I, and I worked it out, but there are there are people out there who who can't mm-hmm. afford that, so they're making a choice between paying paying their their mortgage or their rent and and paying for their copay for their medication. Mm-hmm. And we know plenty of situations, even our own clientele, where people are are not taking medication as prescribed because it's less expensive to do it that way. Well, Mike and Tirza, what you're really talking about is how um, we start off focusing on wellness and people's health Mm -hmm. and what is humane and what is just, and very soon we're talking about finances Mm -hmm. and what's affordable Mm -hmm. and how people make compromises or can't afford certain things and it hampers their health and in fact in this country 45,000 people every year die primarily because they do not have health insurance coverage Mm -hmm. which is really an incredible incredible tragedy. Well, it sounds to me more like a crime than a tragedy. I mean, we, we are supposedly the richest country in the world, and yet we have one of the least accessible, least efficient, and uh, um, least affordable health care systems in the world. Mm-hmm. Everybody else, all the other Western countries, and then considerable number of third world countries, so-called, have figured out how to do this, uh, and we haven't. How, how come? Well, uh, again, you're talking about politics, you're talking about uh, the history of political movements in this country and how things are perceived. Uh, So even though we're talking about a publicly financed, privately delivered program, uh, often opponents will refer to that as socialized medicine. Well, it's Mm -hmm. not really socialized medicine um, because, again, uh, the government isn't providing the health care. Mm-hmm. So that's Although, the difference between socialized medicine and single payer. The yes. government is is paying for the health care through a system of taxation, but the, the health care delivery is private. Correct. Okay. So, uh, you know, socialized medicine is the National Health Service in Great Britain. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not what's in Canada. It's not what's in a number of other countries. But an example that you could call socialized medicine in this country is the VA. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the VA has some really um, high quality standards that they have met. Um, now they're challenged certainly with all the returning uh, mm-hmm. veterans who've been injured in Iraq and Afghanistan, mm-hmm. etc. But nevertheless, uh, it's a system that gets high marks, and that's actually government-run. Well, it's also but we're a, not we're not uh, proposing something that is government-run. No, it's well, Medicare itself financed. is socialized medicine, isn't it? Well, not really, because no? it's privately it's delivered. It's privately delivered as well. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So that's why the model is a, a kind of improvement. Yeah. And that is and is that is different than the Obama Care plan. Right. It is different. Uh, again, the Obama plan is still is privately delivered okay. and it is financed through the system we have now with a uh, wide range of insurance companies and insurance plans, etc., many of whom are obligated as their first priority to reap a profit for their shareholders, not to provide medical care. So it sounds like Obamacare, uh, far from being socialized medicine, was really a boon to the insurance companies. Well, it really has been in many respects because through the mandate, they will get uh, millions of more uh, customers. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, But I'd like to shift, if I could, the conversation to another aspect of the finances. Uh, um, One of the things that is hampering business now as we try to recover from the recession is that in all the other countries government provides health care. Only in this country do businesses have to provide health care. 
Um, you mean and because fewer people and get fewer it through their employers, you mean? Right. Okay. Right. So only in this country do most people uh, have to receive health care through health care coverage through their employment. Isn't that one of the complaints that the auto industry had that that because they had to provide health care for their employees, it was adding something like fifteen hundred dollars on every car that was manufactured? Yeah, that's right. And, and that made actually, them not competitive with companies that that uh, from other countries like uh, um, what um, the Korean Motor Company that what puts out the Kia and the Toyota yeah, and Hyundai, Hyundai and, and those sure. companies. Sure, and in fact, that led them to locate a plant in Canada versus a plant in Michigan uh, because of that added cost. So our businesses in the Commonwealth would be much more competitive worldwide if they didn't have to pay so much to have their employees covered. And even push businesses to start up here. To, 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 cut, to put plants here, or, or whatever their strategy may call for. It could attract plants and would also allow people who have the entrepreneurial spirit and want to start their own business mm -hmm. to be able to take that risk because they don't have to think, wait a minute, I can't do that because I won't be able to afford health care coverage for myself and my family, and how am I going to uh, attract a few mm -hmm. good employees mm -hmm. because I can't provide it to them. Oh, it's already covered as part of this system. So people don't have to worry about losing health care coverage if unfortunately they're laid off or if they encounter a serious illness and um, you know are not uh, declared disabled. Uh, and they don't have to worry about it if they switch employers mm -hmm. or, again, smart, start a small business. So, mm -hmm. actually, this plan would be the engine of economic activity and economic growth, and, and we believe will add thousands and thousands of new jobs and jobs that pay well here in Pennsylvania. So, what it does is it provides humane, just health care for all, it reduces the cost of health care that's paid by our taxes mm -hmm. for uh, municipal employees, uh, school district employees, oh, etc. Right, because they're not going to have to pay that. I don't right. Know. That's that's a big um, it, uh, and it promotes uh, economic growth, and it's uh, what we believe is the most fiscally sustainable uh, model that's out there. And in fact, uh, one of the things that we're working on is raising money to um, have an economic impact study. We're saying you can look at other states where they've done these studies and it proves that single payer is the most economic system and the most fiscally sustainable system, uh, bar none. But we need to have one here in Pennsylvania. We did our research back in '09 but it was not as comprehensive as we would like. So we basically are raising funds to have a outside third-party organization, an objective organization that does this type of research, come into Pennsylvania and see if our numbers are correct. And um, it'll cost us about $60,000 for that study. Right now we've raised about 20000 and so we're soliciting contributions for that. So this is a member organization, Healthcare for All PA? Well, we're a grassroots organization. We've just developed member categories. We've not been that official before. Mm -hmm. But if people are interested in uh, checking out our organization and joining it, they can go to Healthcare for All, and that's the number four, healthcareforallpa.org. And uh, there is a way to make a tax-deductible contribution to our education fund there, and also as part of that uh, to say, I want to donate to having this economic impact study done. Okay. So. Yeah. So th this this or uh, this this is a bill that you actually have introduced into the, the state legislature. Well, this yeah, this is the. Uh, fourth time it's been introduced in the state legislature, which isn't unusual for any bill, but particularly one as comprehensive as this. 
and it's Senate Bill 400. It's the Family and Business Health Security Act of 2011, and it's been reintroduced by the uh, prime sponsor for the last uh, two sessions in the Senate, State Senator Jim Furlow, um, who represents Pittsburgh and and parts of Westmoreland and I believe Armstrong County and maybe uh, and obviously parts of Allegheny County. Um, and so Senator Furlow uh, believes fervently in the single-payer approach and has introduced this legislation, uh, reintroduced it. We now have six co-sponsors in the, in the Senate and it should be uh, reintroduced in the House uh, shortly. So is this just a Democratic effort in, in the House? Well, no, actually, over the years, we've gained some Republican support uh, because we basically are a nonpartisan organization. In fact, uh, some of our board members are Republicans, and our president is a retired uh, Republican state legislator, mm and small business owner. He retired after 16 years in the state house. So this is really a nonpartisan issue. Exactly. Because so the issue is really fairness. Do, do we want to, to we want to live in a country where health care is considered a right, a human right? Or do we want to live in a country where health care is considered a commodity that's to be bought and sold in the marketplace? If you can afford it, hooray, you get it. If you can't afford it, too bad. Yeah. That's your problem. We don't have any responsibility for you. So that's really the issue we're talking about here. What kind of a country do we want to live in? What kind of state do we want Pennsylvania to be? Is it a commonwealth that takes care of its people, or is it just another place to buy and sell things? Well, you speak to the heart of, uh, heart of uh, the issue, and in fact, our logo is the Liberty Bell Ooh. with a heart uh, <laughs> emblazoned on the Liberty, Liberty Bell, and we believe that that uh, symbolizes the values of Pennsylvania. Uh, so yeah, you speak to the heart of it. So we really are talking about being humane and being fiscally responsible yeah. and sustainable. Thank you very much, Bob. Tears as always. Um, check it out at healthcare, the number four, all, dot org. Like, all PA. For all PA dot org. And if you have any comments or questions, please, uh, we any feedback, comments to whatever post you found this on, uh, or you can email us at uh, mike at seclair dot com. Um, and, uh, you know, check us out, uh, iTunes, wherever you want to subscribe to us at, uh, Mediafly, we're of course on YouTube as well, and of course all the episodes are posted at seclair.com slash blog. Um, thank you everybody, thank you, thanks everybody for joining us, and uh, we'll see you guys next time Have on the day. Chatterbox. Mm -hmm.